Um, Vermont Teddy Bear went away at the end of the 95 season. Yep. How difficult a position did that put you in for the following year, 96? Um, it was very difficult, you know, because we were just um, just starting. You know, 95 was uh, a, a breakthrough year. I think we only went home from one or two races. Um, we, we sent home uh, drivers like Dale Earnhardt and, and Dale Jarrett at Richmond, and we qualified like 22nd or something like that. Um, it was, um, it was very sad. I mean, cause we, um, in 1995, um, towards the, I think it was the fall of Dover race. Um, I knew we, I knew that they were thinking of leaving. And I said, probably one of the best ways we could do this is if we could get an Earnhardt bear, a GM Goodwrench Earnhardt bear. Cause the marketing people up there loved the idea. What happened was in '95, John Santino Sorrentino decided to go public. So now you got to deal with board members. They weren't really happy with NASCAR. So we figured if we could get an Earnhardt bear, that would just put us over the edge. So they um, they built me a bear, and um, we talked to Teresa uh, Earnhardt about meeting at Dover to present it to him and to see if we could you know sell the deal because i knew that they were going to want some commission you know being you know a souvenir sale but we said well let's just see what we can do well saturday morning she canceled on me um next thing you know a few weeks later you know vermont teddy bear says we're not coming back november 1st uh teresa calls and said Where's that Earnhardt bear? We want to see it. I called back up to the factory, and um, they said the board's already made their mind. No matter what you do, they're not they're not going to go back to NASCAR. So throughout the winter, um, we chased money. We chased money real hard. Um, again, for two years, I really didn't do a whole lot, so it was hard for me to get a door open. So I uh, I looked at my team and I said. Um, I'm going to run the first seven races um, before our two-week break. We're going to push hard, and if we can't get a sponsor, then we'll shut down. And um, we sent home an average of 22 cars a race, those first seven races. I and we made all of them. Yeah. And um, it was tough, I mean, because um, I, did, I didn't know what to do, you know. Um the uh, we were at Atlanta, and I, I either got caught up in a wreck or blew up or something, and um, I'm in the trailer. Uh, and this is '96, and um, I'm getting ready to get out of my uniform, and all of a sudden I look out the door, and there goes Pete Orr with four shocks in his hands. Pete Orr was driving the '88 car at the time. And I'm like, man, I didn't hear no caution or anything. They're still racing up there. I don't know what's going on. And just about the same time I was thinking about that, I looked at the side door, and, and David Riddling was there. And he goes, can you come drive my car? <laughs> and I said, well, what's wrong? He goes, well, um, Pete says it's it's evil. He can't drive it. Yeah. So I said, sure. So, um, so, you know, so he was taking his shocks and going home. He was going to go rebuild them or something. I don't know what he was okay, doing. All right, okay, okay. He, he yeah. was going to build a car, rebuild the car during, during yeah. the race. So, um, you know, obviously Pete was a tall, slender guy, and here I am, you know, being five foot nine, you know, and so, so he was talking about driving it in that race. Oh yeah, he wasn't. He, was, he wasn't talking about for the races. No, so, he okay. said, "This is the, I need you to practice this car, right? Okay, or, or you know, go out and drive the car in the racetrack. See what's going on." Now, was this in practice or the race? Race. This race. Was during okay, the race. that's what I thought you said. Okay, so. Um, um, I go up and I sit the car and they adjust the steering wheel for me, you know, and, and we got everything in seat belts. So, I, David, as I'm going down pit road, David said, "Now take it easy, you know, get used to this thing because I don't want you to get hurt, right?" I said, "No worries." So I take off down pit road and I make up, get up to speed on the back stretch, and all of a sudden the spotter goes, "Leaders off, off two. So I just kept driving the race car. All of a sudden, David comes over about four laps later. He goes, what do you think? And I was like, I wish my car would drive like this. He goes, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. He says, you're pulling away from the leader with the same amount of laps on the tires. 
I said, you want me pit? He goes, hell no, finish the damn race. So I finished the race, you know, 25 laps down or whatever it was. So um, the last race of the seven races was Bristol. And um, I'm, uh, I'm loading up and um, knowing that it was my last race. And all of a sudden, on the, again, at the side door, um, uh, Ray Smith from Chevrolet and David Redling standing at the door. And they're like, what, what are you doing now? And I was like, I have no idea. I'm done. And uh, Ray says, David wants to meet you tomorrow about driving the 88 car. So um, I go over Sunday morning at their race shop, and we talked. And um, I said, what happened? He goes, halfway through the race at Bristol, Pete came in. He said, I need to beat you at the back of the holler. And um, David's like, man, I didn't see him hit the wall or anything. What's going on? The motor blew up or whatever. And Pete got out of the car, went in the lounge, and says, I can't do this anymore. Wow. So um, between Ray Smith from Chevrolet and, and David, you know, they they took me from the LePage Motorsports to become a LePage driver. What kind of a relationship did you and David have? You know, the first year, um, we had a great relationship. Yeah. Um, we we should have won a handful of races. Uh, we run second at Michigan. Purvis was on a fuel mileage, and we were running them down. I mean, it. it I think I caught him at the, at the start finish line. I mean, if it had been another lap, I'd have beat him. You know, um, we obviously won at Homestead. I mean, we won. We should have won that year half a dozen races. Either a bad pit stop, you know, something um, stupid happened, you know, but we had some really good races. Um, unfortunately, and I wish, I wish David would have, I wish we probably wouldn't have won Homestead because once we won Homestead, um, David got greedy and started the second team. Um, brought in Lance Crackers with Dennis Setzer. And um, before you know it, I mean, he was short on money because the hype deal fell apart. And uh, so he was bringing in investors. And then the investors said, hey, the only way I'm going to do it is if my son can drive. And next thing you know, I'm running a part schedule and get, you know, get got fired. I mean, it was just... Um, just a snowball effect, and it ended up destroying the race team, you know, because he didn't know how to manage the two-car team. So, um, I mean, we remain friends, you know, after. And um, and I actually, unfortunately, David right now has got some issues. He's in jail, and, um, yeah. Is he real? Yeah, yeah. He got, uh, got caught doing some funny stuff and um, with money and, He's in uh, he's in uh, prison right now. Fifty, let's see, I'm fifty nine, so he's fifty eight years old, fifty nine years old. Yeah, I yeah. did not know that. Yeah, going back to Homestead, <laughs> you won, but not only did you win the first race of your Bush Series career, you also beat Bobby Labonte and Mark Martin to the finish line to do it. What do you remember about that race, specifically about that race? Um, uh, several things. Um, it, it actually was um, a great highlight of my career. Um, a day that made me smile for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hours. And um, from that point on, when I had a bad day at a racetrack, um, I'd go home and I'd watch that replay of the race. Would you really? And listen to Ken Squire and uh, Ned Jarrett, you know, call it. Um, we had a fast Chevy that day. Um, we, I think we were like 12th, 15th in qualifying, and you know, just happened to drove up to the front, come in, lose about 10, 15 spots, do it all over again. Um, probably one of the coolest thing that Ned said is, um, 
when I was passing Bobby Labonte, uh, Ken Squire was talking, shocking. And uh, <laughs> he says, Ken, he says, uh, he said, Bobby Labonte just ran a tenth faster than he qualified. He said, that's unheard of. And I pass, I was, while I was being passed, while he was being passed, well, about four laps later, Ned comes over to radio or TV and he goes, Ken, he said, I hate to reiterate this, but he says, Kevin LePage just ran three tenths faster than a pole speed leading this race. I mean, a car was on a rail. And, you know, at the end, um, you know, to be in victory lane, beating, you know, Bobby and Mark and Nemechek was fourth, I believe. Um, I knew that it was, I was complete. But now I was, and now I was a race car driver. And um, that night we went out to dinner, uh, took the team out to dinner. And um, all of a sudden, this large cake come over and I said, well, I didn't order any dessert or anything, you know, and it says, congratulations, Kevin, on your win. And I said, I didn't order it. And they said, no, that guy over there did. And, he, and out walking out the door is Jack Roush. No kid. And that was where the beginning where he started watching me. Wow. You talked about parting ways with David late the next season. You moved to 19, uh, in 1998, you did move to Winston Cup with Joe Falk. Uh, was that just part of the overall plan, or did he come to you with a specific offer? Uh, actually, it started in 97. Okay. Uh, Joe came to me um, in, in uh, I think, halfway through the 97 season. Um, he had started the season with Mike Wallace with Spam. Uh, spam dropped them. They were struggling, not making races. And uh, I said, uh, we want you to drive our car in New Hampshire. I said, all right. Um, and it might have been 97 that I left David. I guess it would. I guess yeah, that would be yeah, the following year. Yeah. So uh, we're up in New Hampshire, and um, we're about mid-pack. And so we get ready to qualify, and uh, I nailed one and two. Nailed it. And the reason I know I nailed it because I got the, the practice sheet or the, you know, the segment sheet after. I was third fastest. Well, when you're going through one and two that fast, you carry all that momentum getting into three and four, and I overshot the corner, uh, missed the race. So... Joe called me the following week, and he goes, I hate that you missed the race, but you ran so good. He says, we're going to go test at Charlotte. And if you test good down there, we're going we're gonna to go back for the race. I said, all right. So we go down to Charlotte. Doug Riker's my crew chief. Clyde Booth is our engineer. And I'm out there. Kind of floundering around, you know, again, it's the first time in a cup car at a mile and a half, you know, super speedway. And uh, all of a sudden Clyde says, I'm going to go down in one and two. And when you hear me say now, I want you to lift and jump on the brakes. When you hear me say now, I want you to get off the brakes and step on the gas. It's all right. So I go down into one now, now. I was like, Wow. I said, that, that caught me off guard. He goes, that's what you need to do. I said, all right. So we go out and we make another run. Four tenths. He goes, all right. He said, you got one and two figured out now. Let's go to three and four. Same thing. So he goes, all right. Doug, he said, I think he's ready to do a qualifying mock-up run. So we put tires on, taped it up, and uh, we go out top of the board. 26 cars there, and we're at the top. All of a sudden at 8.55, because we stopped practice at 9, 8.55, Ryan Newman goes out and beats me by half a tenth with Penske equipment. Yeah. Joe says, we're going back for the race. 
so we go back for the for the race and um, I qualified 12th, I think it was. And uh, Saturday morning we go out. We're doing a you know practice session. We take our qualifying motor out, put our race motor in. <laughs> Third lap on the racetrack, I drive off into turns one, and that thing turned around as fast as it could shake a stick. Killed the car. And come to find out, Nemechek was driving for Felix at the time. And they had just changed the rear end gear, and, and they never put the rear end plug back in. His first lap in the racetrack, he rolled down the racetrack right in front of me. So we didn't have a backup car. Felix felt bad, so they went to the shop and got a car, which was the 42 First Union car that, um, um, what's the name? Wally Dollenbach was racing, and he missed the race. So we, they went and got it, brought it back, and we got my seat in it and fixed it up. That was the most ill handling race car we ever, I ever was in. I mean, it was horrendous, but you know, they gave us a car. And so that performance alone, then I think we went to Atlanta and we ran good Atlanta. So that performance alone, Joe Fock, Doug Riker, Clyde Booth and myself, we formed a, a team to start the 98 season. And when I went to Daytona, I went down for the rookie meeting. And uh, Jerry Nadeau, Steve Park, um, Kenny Irwin, and I think there was a couple of other guys in there. And then I walked in. And they said, um, are you here for what? I said, I'm here to run for rookie of the year. And everybody's like, who are you? You know, they didn't know who I was. And uh, um, the season started. And... Um, about midway through that year, in a two-week session, I had phone calls every day. John Hendrick from Hendrick Motorsports wanted me to drive the 25 car. Richard Childress wanted me to drive one of their cars. Doug Yates wanted me to drive one of their cars. Uh, Jack Roush. Um, Joe Gibbs, JD called me. I mean, it was like every day want to be somebody wanted me to drive one of their cars, but it was always for the '99 season. It wasn't for '98. Yeah. Except for Jack Roush. Jack says we'll put you in a car starting the fall Michigan race. So we were out in Sonoma, and. Uh, which was, I think, three or four weeks before the Michigan race, um, I met, sat down with Joe Falk, and I said, um, hey, I just want to let you know um, that I'm going to be leaving you in three or four weeks, you know, whenever the Michigan race is, so you can, you know, for, look for another driver. And the decision I made, reason I made that decision was um, at Atlanta in the spring race, Steve Park got hurt. And Dale Earnhardt asked me to drive that one car. Met with him. And um, I said, what are, what are you paying your driver? And he told me what it was. And I'm like, really? He goes, aren't you getting paid? I said, no, I just get a percentage. He goes, if somebody comes up to Joe with some money, you're out. I said, well, okay, you know. And uh, so... I said, what's your plan? He goes, well, he says, once Steve gets better, which is probably about three or four races from the end, Steve's going to get back into one car. I said, well, I said, that doesn't work for me. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you only run for rookie of the year one time. I said, if you pull me out of the car in five weeks to go, four weeks to go, I may lose it. And he goes, I'll put a second car together for you. He said, but you got to give me an answer before noon tomorrow. So I was on my way to Martinsville, and I called Ricky Rudd. I called Terry Labonte. I you know, called a handful of guys, and I was like, look, this is my position. And they looked at me, and they said, 50 cents and loyalty won't buy you a cup of coffee nowadays. Worry about yourself. So I called Dale about 11 o'clock, and he goes, and he said, if you would have given me an answer last night, he said, I know to call me today, but if you give me an answer last night, he said, I'd put you in that one car, but... Penzel had pressured me so bad, and they put Daryl in the car. And that year, 98, Daryl used 27 out of 28 provisionals or something like that, you know, past champions. So um, I ended up taking the Roush deal. 
after swimming upstream for as long as you had and having one deal, you know, not turn out the way that you might have liked after another, what was it like to go to a team that was at the time one of the sports powerhouses? I mean, absolute powerhouse. Um, it was an honor to, to, to take the deal. Um, but it's also it was a huge disappointment two weeks after. Um, I met with Jeff Smith up in uh, a little small restaurant outside of the Speedway up in Michigan. Yeah. And Jeff, um, Jeff says, you know, we're going, we're, we're, I mean, we're an hour away. And he goes, I don't want anybody to know that we're talking, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, no problem. So my wife came with me. She was my business partner, spotter, moral support. And I said, so how's, how does Roush Racing operate? And I said, simple. It's open book. We're five teams. You can go to the six car with Mark Martin, Jimmy Finney. You can go to Frankie Stoddard and Burton's. You can go to Johnny Benson, who was my teammate anyway. Or you can go to Chad Little's team. At any racetrack, ask Crucci for their setup book. Tire pressures, uh, tire pressures, uh, shock bills, anything you want. I said, well, I said, that's exactly what I want is to be part of a team that it's a team effort. So I took the deal and we go to Michigan and we were, we were pretty decent in the, in the race. Uh, I've been in practice. Um, again, you know, never doing a lot of qualifying, you know, with some really good equipment. Um, I, Overdrove one and two, slid up the racetrack, ended up starting, I think, 28th or something like that. I uh, think I finished in the top 15. Next week we go to Bristol. They built me a brand new car. And, uh, I mean, we, we ran in the top 10 all night long. Ended up 10th. Tuesday we're up in Liberty, a normal meeting with Jack. And Jack comes in, he's got a smile from ear to ear. He goes, man, he said, this is unexpected. Um, because when Jack and I met to sign the contract, Jack looked at me and he goes, I think you're too young at 32 years old. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do the best job I can for you. So to finish 10th on my second cup race with him, you know, that was very impressive. Now, is that the weekend that you won? Uh, no. The Bush race? No. Okay. Uh, yes, it, yes, I think it was. I yeah. think I was running a channel lock car that day. Yeah, I think yeah. it was a combination. That was a yeah. good weekend. And so uh, all of a sudden he goes, all right, guys, thank you. He said, oh, wait, driver, crew chief, team manager, stay. So we hung around, and he goes, um, well, I just want to let you know there's uh, new rules in Roush Racing. And I look at him, and I'm like, what, what new rules? He goes, spring shocks and sway bar are confidential. Everything else is yours. And my crew chief at the time, James Ince, says, what are you talking about, Jack? He goes, well, some other guys in the organization are thinking that we're handing everything to you, which they had to learn everything. So we're taking it away from you. And this is two races into your two deal. Two races into my, 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 my deal. And, um, I mean, James, I mean, I, um, luckily there was nothing near him to throw because he was getting ready to throw something. And um, we we struggled. We struggled as, as a group up there, Johnny and I, because we had to fend for ourselves. And throughout the three years I was there, um, there was times when Jack would come over to radio and, and say, hey, you need to slow down and let Mark lead a lap if I'm leading a race. Or um, you need to slow down, let Burton pass you, you're holding them up, and then I'd let him pass me, and I'd pass him back a couple laps later. And um, there, was, there was so much animosity between Mark and Jeff against me that it was, it was frustrating to even go you know, to the racetrack and, and try to be a teammate. Uh, we were at Charlotte um, for one of the races. I qualified six. Mark was like 12th, 15th, Burton was 20-something, and Johnny and Chad were in the back. 
And uh, I come out of the garage, and there's Burton and, and uh, Mark and Jack's ear. They, they're giving us the better motors. Well, our, my motors came out of Livonia, and, and Mark's and Jeff came out of Mooresville. So that weekend, um, that Saturday, uh, Friday, um, my crew chief at the time was Pat Trison. And uh, he had gotten married, but he hadn't had time to do a family get-together. So they were planning a big family get-together on Friday. And uh, they, uh, Jack comes over and he says, you need to take your motor out. We're taking it tomorrow. We're taking it over to the engine shop and dyno in. So I'm sitting there talking with Pat. Here comes Frankie's daughter. And Frankie knew that they had this big family get-together. And Frankie goes, hey, uh... Pat, hope you ain't got nothing planned tomorrow. And as Frankie's walking out, I as loud as I could yell, I didn't care. I said, hey, Pat, I says, when you get the motor out, stop by my house and grab my balls because that's going to be the difference. My motor was 12 horsepower down to both Mark's and Jeff's. But I beat him in qualifying. And um, so several... Several more incidents like that throughout my time with Roush uh, was disheartening. Didn't Pat quit during a race at Bristol? Was that with you or was that with somebody else? That uh, was somebody else. Pat, okay. Pat right. left me. Um, our last race together with Roush was Atlanta. Okay. And that's when he went to the Wood Brothers. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, I went down to the shop to uh, clean out my office, and um, I walked into the shop and I said, "Where's Pat?" And they're like uh, nobody wanted to tell me where, and I knew he was already gone up to Wood Brothers. And I said, "Well, where's my car?" And they're like, "It's up there on the on the on the uh, lift, car lift. No suspension, no motor, no running gear. And this is Tuesday." And they're like, "Oh, don't worry. Well, you know, we we don't have to be there until Thursday night, right?" So I go over Friday morning, Pat's back, you know, at the car, and, and um, next thing you know, Pat leaves. He's over to 21, so he's working both cars, right? So I go on the racetrack, and this is probably the second most evil car ever driven. And Atlanta was, you know, one of my favorite racetracks where if you go back in record, it's probably my best finishing racetracks and qualifying. And uh, I think we're like 45th out of 45 cars. Um he worked a little bit on the car. I went back out, blew a motor. And um, they come over with a spare motor and it looked like they went to the local junkyard and got it. Somebody had already run it a thousand miles or whatever. I mean, it was yeah. horrendous. Put it in the car and um, we went out and missed the race. So I'm in, in the, the 16 car. In the 16 car. Yeah. And earlier that year, um, they had a meeting uh, with Valvoline because Valvoline was leaving the six car, but yet Valvoline had been the longest sponsor, you know, with the car with Jack, and they wanted to stay with me. And um, Jack didn't didn't want to take him, didn't want to keep him. And the only reason I know this is because I flew back from one of, one of my appearances down the road with the um, guy from Valvoline. He told me the whole story, so. Not knowing the exact numbers, just hypothetically say it was, uh, you know, a fifteen million dollar deal. Well, they wanted to pay fourteen million because I'm not Mark Martin, you know, hadn't won a bunch of races and stuff. Which to me is like, okay, we could run on that kind of money, right? They didn't want to do it. Jack didn't want to take it, and I think the reason they didn't want to take it because I think um, Jack didn't want Valvoline to talk to Pfizer about how. How, how the marketing was going on, how the money was being spent and all that kind of stuff because Valvoline has been there for all these years, right? So uh, I'm in the holler cleaning out my locker and Jeff Smith comes up and, he go, and he's got a contract in, in his hand. He goes, you need to sign this. Because in Roush Racing, if by September 1st you don't get a release notice, your contract's still active to the following year. Well, I didn't get released because they were still working on monies. And... Um, they didn't get anything, so they shut down. And I was like, you can take that contract and put it, you know, where? I said, you just embarrassed me at one of my favorite racetracks. I said, screw you. 
So uh, about two, three weeks later, Jack calls me to meet at their office. And I go down there, and there's a contract with the paper, with a pen, and Jeff Smith's going on, and I told him to shove it up his butt. And, and uh, all of a sudden, Jack takes his hat off and sets it on the table, and he goes, do you own a couple Bush cars? I said, yeah. He goes, have you read my contract? So not word for word. He goes, well, he said, there's, an art, there's a paragraph in here that says, I have the right of first refusal to allow you to drive anything but a Roush performance car. He said, if you remember Steve Grissom, when he and Gary Bechtel split, he had a contract. Steve didn't, didn't want to get away from it. So Gary paid him, but he also didn't, put, didn't let him drive anything. I said, where's Steve Grissom now? He says, you'll go to the racetrack every week. He says, I guarantee I have a broom handle that'll fit them hands of yours. Ooh. <laughs> so, uh, needless to say, I signed a contract with him. Um, the contract for the 90, for what season? That would have been for the uh, 2000 season. Okay. I think 99 was my last year. I think I was at Roush, or 2001, whatever it was. Yeah, it was two, for the following yeah. year. Yeah. So, about. Uh, I think a year or two later, uh, Jack's di uh, dad died, and uh, after after we split throughout the season, because I was driving for Morgan McClure, uh, when I met Jack in the garage area, he'd put his head down and he'd walk one way or the other. He would never meet me face to face. And so the day he is the week his dad died, I went over and Jack turned away from me and started walking away. And I walked over and I grabbed him and I said, "Hey, man." Sorry for your loss. I said, your dad was a great man. I loved his dad. Dad was an amazing person. And he looked at me, and he goes, thank you, Kevin. And so I turned around and started walking away, and, and he grabbed me. He goes, I'm sorry. He said, I never gave you what I was supposed to give you. He said, I listened to too many people. He says, if you ever, ever need anything from me, just look me up. And um, I, I've always had so much respect for Jack. It's just the people underneath him that I didn't have respect for.